So I'd like to welcome uh, Rosie uh, Boycott, who, as I was just telling you a moment ago, was a legend when I was growing up and still is in my book. Uh, amazing woman, amazing. Co-founder of the feminist magazine Spare Rib and the, a publishing company Virago Press and editor of men's magazine Esquire, as well as national mass market newspapers Independent, Independent on the Sunday, Daily Express. And what I always remember seeing a, a newspaper article about how Rosie Boycott, the famous newspaper editor, had moved and was like doing this food stuff in a garden somewhere in the countryside. I was like, what is going on? But I just think that was a further inspiration to me because it shows, of course, that we can all have multiple identities, which I think is something that's particularly important for women. So good on you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, uh, of course, currently she is chair of the London Food Board. Also, um, very much uh, like to welcome Deborah Johnston, who's a reader in development economics at the School of um, Afri uh, Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. And uh, Deborah works on labour, gender, poverty and health in sub-Saharan Africa mainly, and um, works on agriculture and nutrition issues. In fact, she and I worked together, I think, four years ago now, on um, a, a, a report which was mapping the research landscape uh, for agriculture and, and nutrition. So fantastic to have you both. And um, we're going to start off uh, with Rosie, who's going to talk for 20 minutes or so, and then move on to a presentation. So thank you. Please thank go you. ahead. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Corinna, and thank you, Raquel, and thank you all for being here. And uh, um, I don't have any answers to this question. Um, so actually what, where this talk ends up, I'm not really too sure, but I hope that it will engage you in the way that it's now a subject that is really, really engaging me. And uh, I'm kind of keen to explore it, and I hope that by the end of it, I'll have heard some really interesting suggestions from people in the room. We... Um, I, I suggested this as a topic, basically, food and feminism, um, or you could call it who does the cooking in 2016 and onwards, um, to the Women of the World Festival, uh, which I am I'm lucky enough to be on the, on the management committee on and have been since it started. And um, we actually did the session on Friday, and I woke up in the morning um, incredibly anxious because I thought there'll be nobody there. <laughs> But in fact, as Rebecca, who was here, who brilliantly came and chaired it, um, we had about 250 people turned up. And so I felt, well, it didn't, again, didn't actually give me any answers. It made me think, well, we're kind of onto something here. And this is something we all need to think about and talk about. And in a nutshell, the, the question is, if we're going to cook again, and if we don't cook again, it seems to me, we won't sort out our screwed up food system. If we're going to cook again, is it going to be women who are going to end up back in the kitchen doing the cooking? Because if that is the trade-off, or if that is what it's going to cost, then it's not going to work. Once again, it won't work. And that's the subject that I want to explore and I want to sort of throw down as a challenge in a way to all of us who think about food and food policy and the culture of food. And I take it from the fact that we're all in this room that we all know and understand that food is incredibly important. Um, I like very much what Sheila said in her talk here, however many weeks ago. And she said, and I've always agreed with her about that, she said something to the effect that food is an optic through which you can see the world. It's a very, very clear way that you can see questions of justice, uh, exploitation, inequality, uh, fairness both to human beings, to children, and to the planet. And that was never more so true than it is today. Um, and I'm really excited about hearing about all of Deborah's work in, in Africa, because in our little chat we had waiting 10 minutes ago, she was just talking about how you know modern life and what's happening to women is just massively changing, how they cook, how they eat, what they buy. And so I, I, I written a sort of small presentation, which I will kind of try and adhere to a bit, because I've tried to follow a little bit of what I think of as the history. Um, we, Western feminism, if you go back into it, is absolutely littered with stuff about cooking being, a, cooking being a drag, cooking being something that we shouldn't do. I'm going to come on to talking a bit more about Sparib in a minute, but I can only talk you know, about my own growing up, which was that 
my father, he had one recipe, and, and that consisted, we used to fish, he used to fish, I used to help, and, I, and it was one thing we did together, he taught me how to dry fly fish, and we would catch a fish, he called for fish often, I didn't catch fish so often, but nevertheless, when we did, we would take a copy of the Times, which was the newspaper he read, and we'd have it by the riverbank. You put the Times into the river, you soak it completely wet, you bundle the fish up in it, tie up the ends, and then you'd put it on the open fire. And at, if the trout is about the right size for a river trout, something like that, at the moment that the Times goes into flames, the fish is cooked. And I tell you, this, this really worked. And, but that was my father's contribution to the household cooking. My mother, on the other hand, was someone who hated cooking. Um, my mother was actually my main reason why I ended up founding a feminist magazine, because it was a negative impulse, which was, I don't want to end up like my mother. I didn't know what I wanted to end up doing or being like or anything, but I didn't want to end up as someone who was very clever, uh, who didn't work, who stayed at home, who did a whole lot of kind of female tasks not very well. Uh, she knitted, I still have the ones that the moths haven't got, I still have a vast collection of jumpers, my mother died a long time ago, vast collection of weird jumpers, strange bits of craft, um, clothes that she made that didn't really work very well. And then this memory of this really dreary food. Um, food was, my mum dished up three meals a day for my father, for my sister, for myself, depending on who was there. And it, it was so clear she didn't like it. I've always really envied people who have nice memories of cooking, sitting around the kitchen with their mother, the kind of whole thing of food being wholesome. And I know that for lots of women and, and mothers of friends of mine, I can remember that you know, cooking was a huge bit of their self-expression in a time when there were, you know, for women actually say in the 50s, 60s, there were pretty difficult finding ways to express yourself. Food was one of the ways you could do it. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't for my mother. So I grew up, I mean, by the time I was 17, 18, I, I had left home. I don't think I could cook anything at all. Um, and when we started Spare Rib, one of the things I said was, um, don't cook, don't type. Uh, it seemed to me very important <laughs> advice. <laughs> Um, of course, I had to learn to type because I was a journalist, so I could sort of park that bit. But the cooking bit, well, I kind of held on to it. And we were all very young. We didn't have kids, um, which was, in a way, one of the great strengths of Spare Rib because it gave us a naivety that led to an optimism, that led to a belief that, yes, we could change the world. The moment children enter your life, everything upends itself, as women have known throughout the century and still know today. But Personally, I really didn't cook until my 30s. Um, what happened during the 70s, though, to the food world, as women, at huge speed, really, started to get into the workplace, not just into the workplace, but into good jobs. I mean, we went from, in the 60s, there being about 20% of female lawyers, you know, to today, when there's about 60%. Same statistics you can look at all across the professions. And what went hand in hand with that through the 70s was a consumer society that began. And if you take the household budgets on food, roughly 30% of a household budget prior to 1970 went on food. A really staggering amount, if you kind of think about it today, 30% of your take home pay. But we did it, and you didn't really think anything about it. But what happened in the 70s was that cheap food became the order of the day. Cheap food convenience food, and we went from a point of view, I mean, I, I don't know if anyone's old enough to remember things like the Vespa curry, um, which was something that we used to get as a treat to have in front of the television. This was when I was at home, and it was a kind of you know, strange looking thing in a dish, and then TV dinners, where you'd have a slice of turkey and gravy and peas and potato, again, in a plastic dish with little sort of trays. I mean, that was seen as, but that was like very rudimentary. But suddenly, through the 70s, leading into the 80s, leading up to Shirley Conran's famous line, life is too short to stuff a mushroom. I mean, maybe it is true that life is too short to stuff a mushroom, but her, her meaning of that, which was very popular, was 
uh, girls, just, just don't do this. You've got better things to do with your time. And into the breach stepped Marks and Spencers, um, Sainsbury's, all the people that made you the ready meal. And I can remember Marks and Spencers adverts, which would say, don't be embarrassed about decanting our duck a la range, buy six of them, decant them in, and pretend that you've cooked them. I used to do just that, and it, it seemed to me completely fine. And in a way, there was a, we were still very naive about what we were eating. Um, people weren't aware of what was kind of creeping up on the world at that point. We weren't, I mean, I don't think there weren't as many antibiotics in cheap meat. Uh, there wasn't a, quite as much processed food in the supermarkets, um, but it was all on its way. And the thing is, it created, all those things together created a kind of perfect storm. If we, food had to become cheap in order for the consumer economy to exist. We had to, uh, we got down to by the middle of the 80s spending about 10% of the household budget on food. So that gave you 20% to spend on holidays and televisions and clothes and everything that suddenly started to burst onto the world. And of course, from a political point of view, the, uh, this, was, this was wonderful. The food companies were the friends of the politicians because they could guarantee you cheap food. Nobody talked about whether it was good food. They just guaranteed you cheap food that was apparently tasty and there was uh, a very happy belief. And indeed, actually, um, my boss, who, who I am very fond of, um, but, I mean, he will say to me, you know, surely some foods, you know, he, he doesn't get that not all, all food is equal. And, and actually, that's true. Most people still don't understand that all food is not equal. So, even when I had my daughter, which I had Daisy when I was 33, I, I slowly started to learn to cook then. But again, it was something that I did not take that seriously. Um, I just thought, you know, food kind of happened, it was nice. I could understand the value of being able to cook a dinner party. I liked doing that. So I didn't really, um, really worry. But then there was a point where it changed me. As, as Corinna said, she, you know, she wondered, she read that I ran a farm. Well, what happened was that when I left editing the Daily Express, um, we got bought uh, almost overnight by a pornographer who had made all his money out of magazines like Asian Babes. It was kind of literally like waking up into my worst nightmare. Um, and it, it, it was an extraordinary sort of moment. Anyway, I knew my days of running a newspaper were done. Um, I waited till I got paid off and sacked, um, which took a while, a slightly uncomfortable few months. But um, I used the money and I, I started the small holding. I, I'm not really quite sure why, looking back on it, why I did this, except that we had rented a cottage in the country and nearby there was an old wall garden that was not used and suddenly, and I liked gardening, I'd always liked gardening, my husband is a very good gardener, it seemed like a good idea. And the consequence of that was absolutely massive for me. Yes, and, and just as a by the by, because you're all half third my age, you know, you can have so many lives in this life. Don't ever think there's only one of them. Because suddenly I found myself, you know, one year editing a newspaper and about a year later digging in the carrots. And it made me very happy to dig in the carrots. And it, it taught me just about how important food was, that it wasn't just about what you ate. It was about, really about everything, this is what you guys study, I mean, everything that makes the world work or not work. And as a consequence of having this small holding, diddly dee, uh, I ended up with this wonderful job of running the London Food Board. And that's what I've been doing now for, amazingly, nearly eight years, um, since about the time that Boris came in. And it's been a fantastic journey of discovery and um, interest and all sorts of wonderful things have happened and all sorts of unbelievably frustrating things have happened. I mean, it's very nice to be able to sit here today and think that maybe some of the campaigning we have done has resulted in the first, you know, that George Osborne is going to put a sugar tax on in two years' time. Why is he waiting two years? All the cigarette duties going on by two and a half hours' time. Uh, and I think that that should happen to the sugar tax. Anyway, uh, but what's been obsessing me a lot lately is this question of how do we, how do we square this circle in the sense of how do we ensure or try to ensure that if we, if we can get people to cook again, will it only be women? Um, the truth is that, I mean, we all know it's 
cooking went off the curriculum in schools in the 1970s, at the same time that all this was happening. And the importance of cooking, or it was being seen as something that women didn't have, girls didn't have to be taught, or boys, but I mean that we didn't have to be taught to do it. It just fell off. The kitchens were taken over in most schools because free school meals were stopped or school meal procurement was outsourced. Uh, kitchens became classrooms. I mean, it's an extraordinary process. You know, in the last, having watched the school food plan go into action over the last year and a half, to see schools having to you know, liberate space, to put the kitchen back, to sort of bring all this back. We had it all once, and it was amazing. Anyway, we lost it. Little by little, we lost it. School cooking classes became how to deal with the microwave. The microwave became, for lots of people, the only instrument they had in their kitchen. 40% of British households ceased to have dining room tables. New designs of, of uh, new build flats, they had tiny kitchens and a living room where there really wasn't room for the family, if you had a family, to sit around and cook. And again, the industry, it's hard to know which came first, but the industry would provide you with a different meal for five people in a household to eat all on their own, on your bed, in front of the TV, on the move, there's a meal for the car, there's a meal for when you get up, you never need to feel hungry, somewhere along the line, there's a snack for everything. And actually, the whole system we have allowed without really saying stop, we have allowed it sort of to destroy cooking and to destroy, well, what do I mean by cooking at home in that way? Um, but we, as I say, we have to get, we have to get back there. Um, so, right, how am I thinking we might do this? <laughs> I've written here, I don't have a lot of answers. That's not helpful either. <laughs> When we, um, when we said in, in, I started Spare Rib with my friend Marsha, who is still my friend, um, we started it in 1972, and we had a very simple idea. We said, it isn't a terribly good idea, looking back on it, but it was quite simple. It was that saying to men, we want a big chunk of your life, but actually we want the good bit too. We want the jobs. We want the education, we want the visibility, the interest, and our share of the loot. And in return, we'd like you to take some of the rubbish stuff off us. That is the cleaning, the cooking, the ironing. And I've been digging around a bit into this lately, and I found all these fascinating marriage contracts that people tried to write. That I have to tell you, they didn't really work at all. Um, One thing, though, men did whip over and colonize, and that was one level of chefing. And I think that that is very curious and interesting, and it, it was something I hadn't thought out, and it came up in our session at WOW this week, on Friday, because we were sh I was sharing the space with a, a cook called Andy, and she was talking about the macho-ness of how men have kind of co-opted and we all know what we're talking about. We're talking about Gordon Ramsay and that kind of shouting and screaming in the kitchen and, you know, taking that extension of the man who, who would sort of, as the head of the household, would carve the large piece of bloody meat that the wife had cooked at the weekend. He would sort of step forward and do this masculine bit. I mean, you know, that's the equivalent of my father cooking a trout or, you know, someone being very nifty on the barbecue like all American presidents, presidents do. But it was... So that side of it they got but they didn't get the other side. So when you talk to women, and I do a lot of this, or a lot of schools or whatever it is, and you try and say, so why aren't you cooking? And the answer is always the same. I don't have any time because our time has been altered. Our time has, it's not just work. It's now all these other things we have to do, um, staying in touch with everybody, trying to watch a box set, having me time exercising, running, going to the gym. I mean, there are so many, many more things than we used to do. But actually, it, it's also true that that's a choice, that it all comes back to we have choice. And I am very proud of women who will say, actually, I'm going to reclaim this space because I know food is important to me, to my family, to the way my kids grow up. And therefore, and I will use and exercise my political power as a consumer to support the local producer, to support fair trade, to support all the other political acts that go with food. But that's still the women saying that. And what I don't really ever hear is the men saying it very much. Um, so 
The other thing that really distresses me is cupcakes. <laughs> you know, my daughter works for the British Council, and oh, I was talking to her about this the other day, and she was saying, and it's the same in City Hall. You can walk around the desk, and any one day in City Hall, there's probably 20 or 30 homemade cakes that people have brought in to show their own. They're all cooked by women. Daisy says the British Council is exactly the same, except there's probably more cakes. And there's cupcakes. And we all sort of worship at the feet of Mary Berry, who cooks just wonderful things with sugar. So it's not good. It's not good, this. So Jamie Oliver has a very good saying. He's, he said, not that long ago, he said, boys, if you want to get the girl, you've got to learn to cook. Now, I really like that. And I think that that's one of the most useful things that anyone could say. And he needs to say it loud and, loud and clear. And there are some cool projects I know about. There's something I heard about in Australia where actually ex-offenders are getting taught how to cook over eight-week periods. There is a wonderful new chain of uh, youth clubs and sort of sports centres called Onside, where part of the deal is you learn to cook. And that's about boys. And in terms of schools now, all 15-year-olds, regardless of who you are, what sex you are, um, you've all got turned out having to cook five or six different savoury things. So there, it is there. But I don't... This is where I'm going to end, because I don't have an answer. I can't say I know what we're going to do. All I know is that it's, it's really important that somehow we find a way to bring cooking back, but to make it an equal opportunity pastime. Thank you. So this is a joint paper, and I'm going to talk to it. And it's a paper that's written with Jasmine Gideon from Birkbeck. And it would have been great if Jasmine could have been here, and she sends her apologies, but unfortunately she couldn't be. Um, a second apology is that, um, and I always say this when I speak to a new audience, I do have a stammer. I will get stuck on words. When that happens, please just bear with me. So I hope it doesn't take away from what you get from this paper. Um, in this paper, what I want to do is talk about the fact that we have a whole new raft of agri-health policy, and, um, and yet it still doesn't deal with issues of um, gender and class. And I want to end a little bit talking about why that is. But a bit like Rosie, I don't have all the answers. So I kind of set up a problem and talk a bit about why I think that happens. But I'll be really interested to hear <laughs> from people in the audience you know, why they think that happens also. Um, so. Before I start, I thought I should say what is agri-health policy because I know we all come here with different backgrounds and we work in this area in different ways. And um, when I talk about agri-health policy, I'm talking about these, you know, these um, new policies that were put into place following the food price crisis in 2007, 2008. So while food has remained cheap in um, the north, in many um, low and middle income countries, food prices have not been so cheap and they've importantly been volatile. And it's been a real pressure for the policy response, how to show you actually have policy that can adequately deal with this. Um, and so we've seen a whole raft of policy papers that have come out as a result. And they've often tried to do something different, something really different from what's happened in the past. And um, I have a slide, sort of my summary of what I think is different. And often this is what the policy papers say is, is different and better. And I think the fundamental thing is that agri-health policy, and sometimes it's called agri-nutrition policy, is seen as joining up two previously separate policy strands. And so you now have policy that has um, integrated goals. So rather than just improved agricultural output, just improved agricultural output. You now have agricultural policymakers who are concerned about improving nutritional outcomes, um, rather than having um, a lack of concern about where you know where's the food being eaten. There's sort of um, now a concern about targeting the most nutritionally vulnerable. And rather than having separate budgets and kind of silo planning, the argument now is to find ways to have um, interaction. So perhaps not joint joint budgets, but having interaction in, in, between budgets and, um, and um, plans. And so this really promises to help us find a new answer to, to this recurrent problem of, um, of high food prices in southern countries. Um, but I'm going to argue that, it, that these new policies for the most part, still fail to consider gender and class issues. And I'll come on to why. But before I did that, I was going to tell a story about, about, for me, that brings this issue really 
alive. Um, and these photos are taken from Ethiopia, and I've been working in Ethiopia for about the last six years, d doing research around the lives of female farmers. Um, and I went back in about 2014 for some research for a paper that I kind of wish I was giving now because it would have fitted perfectly with Rosie's talk because it was precisely saying what's the impact of, of women working mm -hmm. in um, low-income countries? How is it changing diet? So perhaps we can convince Rosie another time and we'll all get together and we'll do that, that set of papers because that would have been a really nice comparison. But So I, I went back to study that in this particular area and I got two um, surprises. And the first surprise was... Um, I've been focusing on, on flower farms and the flower sector has massively expanded and female employment has massively expanded in Ethiopia. Um, and what I found when I went back is suddenly in this area there are six flower farms. All of them were now providing a um, lunch to their female workers. They hadn't, uh, only one of them had been doing that when I was last there in 2012. And I was wondering, well, what's happened? Why is that? In, you know, these um, large flower farms are suddenly getting more benevolent. Well, I didn't think it was quite that, you know. Um, and one of the reasons was the food price crisis had hit Ethiopia so, so badly. This was one way that, um, that flower farm managers were trying to keep their workforce, trying to keep them in place, because workers were so desperate trying to maintain uh, food for themselves and their families. They were looking at a much wider range of options now. So flower farm managers were trying to keep labour. Mm. They were trying to capture labour. And they were now providing lunch for workers. So that was my first surprise. My second surprise was this. They were stopping those workers taking the lunch home. So you weren't allowed any takeaways. You had to eat the lunch. And I tried to find out why this was. And what the reason was that before um, farmers had, these large farmers had introduced the policy, women were taking food home for their families. They were eating hardly any of it. These are very poorly nourished women. I did diaries of their diets. You know, you'd be horrified. We'd all be very sort of um, unwell our, ourselves if that was the diet that we lived on. And so when women had this lunch provided, for the most part, they were taking it home. Farmers stopped them doing that. And they stopped them doing that because these were very badly nourished workers. Workers who, when they became pregnant, often got very ill, had a range, had a range of illness. And so farm, farmers wanted their workers to be healthier. And I thought this, for me, is a perfect example of the really complex interactions between gender, food, and capital that we see. So, you know, gender and class have a fundamental um, way of structuring um, issues around food and agriculture. And, um, and it's very complex, I think. So that's the one, that, that's the sort of, I think that story really encapsulates why we have to consider gender and class in these discussions. It's complex and it matters a lot who it is you're talking about when you have agri-health policy. So that's a very general starting point. So let's come on to kind of talking about, um, I'm going to skip that slide because I think it's nicer if I focus on some other elements of this. So, so along with Jasmine, we became really interested in the way that these complex issues of gender, the particular roles that women play in growing food, in processing food, in purchasing it, in preparing it, and in feeding children, um, whether, you know, to what extent gender was taken account of in these wonderful new agri-health policies. And we were also interested to what extent this intersection between gender and class was taken account of. Do we hear about different sorts of women in, this, in these policy documents? Um, so we did um, a literature review. It sounds so boring, and perhaps at points it was. You know, we, we kind of sat there and we just trawled through all of the literature. We, we started from 2010 and we looked at the main, uh, we looked at the websites um, of the organizations that are up here, the World Bank, DFID, spelt wrongly, actually DFID is not spelt like that, um, IFPRI, USAID, WHO and UNICEF. And we tried to find all of their work that was in this area of agricultural policies for nutrition or for health. Um, and I've given a couple of examples on, the, on that side of the sorts of documents we're talking about. And then we went through them to see how they looked at these concepts. You know, how did they deal with these 
with these issues. How did they conceptualise gender? How did they conceptualise class? Um, the reason that we did this was we started out being concerned that in previous policy, this, these issues had often been simplified and that had led to very bad policy. So you had policy that wasn't geared towards women's needs. It wasn't geared towards uh, working women. Um, and, and that meant policy wasn't very good. And so we wondered to what extent this had been formulated in a better way. Um, and so we did these searches. I'm going to give you some of the results of them and then talk about what I guess you all know I'm going to find, which is the fact it wasn't done that well. And we can talk a bit about why that was. Um, so we had... Um, we had... Um, I'm doing the math now, actually. Um, we had 17 papers in this, in this area that kind of came under the rubric of an agri-health policy document for these big institutions, okay? And of them, four made no mention of women anywhere in the documentation. So there was no mention of the gender of the farmer. So actually, in, to the large part, they were assuming that they were male farmers. Um, Nine talked about women farmers and talked about women farmers um, as a particular focus group. But what was interesting about those nine is they didn't talk about women in relation to men. So gender relations weren't there. So what we hear is about the need to target women farmers um, or to include women farmers. But there's no discussion about why they may not be included or about why we might want to target them. So it's a very flat rendering of gender. Um, two had what I called a gender equity approach. And it's really worth talking about what I mean by that and why it actually can be a bit problematic. By gender equity, this is very much about giving women the same access to resources and projects as men. So a really good example, um, the World Bank paper in 2013 looks at improving nutrition through multi-sectoral approaches. And it wants gender equity to be a priority. I mean, this is all good stuff, you know. Um, so that agricultural projects must account for women's childcare role in order to involve women farmers as much as men farmers. And that women farmers must receive the same level of resources as um, male farmers. But the difficulty with this is it's not, apart from the kind of, you know, awareness of women's childcare role, again, there's not really a conception of what the underlying constraints might be. So this is about equity in outcomes without looking at what the different starting points are and the different constraints of men and women. Um, two of the papers had a gender equality approach and far more um, emancipatory in my view. And, I, and to give you an example, so if you, you know, it'd be interesting to see what you think, but th there was a discussion paper written by Anna Hareforth um, um, and others in, two, in, two, in 2012 for the World Bank. And that talked about um, changing attitudes around the gender division of labor within the household. Um, changing um, land tenure policies to actually give women better access to land in the first place. And so it's far more about changing the, the, um, the constraints and the, the kind of environment within which women farmers um, um, grew, grew um, food. So far more emancipatory vision of gender. But looking back, we can see that most of those papers didn't have that. There was still... You know, you know, to the extent women were mentioned, women were mentioned as a simplistic category, you know, women farmers. But that doesn't help us understand why women farmers might be disadvantaged, why, why there might have to be uh, particular attention. We, in the same way, then, we looked at the way these papers, these 17 papers, considered issues around wage work, considered class, different kinds of households. Um, and of the 17, 12 made no mention of the landless, no mention at all. So there are no rural landless households in the policy world that is envisaged in these 12 papers. Um, three mentioned wage workers. And um, to give you an example, we have the work, um, we have a DFID paper in 2014, Can Agricultural Interventions Promote 
nutrition. And that gave fantastic examples from Kenya and Bangladesh of um, the different si situation that, that, um, that wage workers and people who depend on, on purchasing food in markets are in. Um, and so there was really nice, really rich empirical kind of backing to that paper. But interestingly, they weren't really, w when you look at the policy goals part of that paper, there wasn't a clear set of policy goals to you know, target that particular group. Um, two of the papers um, had a much stronger view of the different um, positions and different policy um, issues for um, either landless workers um, or people that are dependent on wage work generally. Um, and um, one of the paper from the, from the FAO um, looked at Asia and was particularly focusing um, on, um, on landless workers and had policy recommendations, had policy goals. How do we improve the, um, the food and nutrition situation for the landless through agricultural policy? And that was far and away the, the best of those papers. So, so the findings of this review um, you'll see, you know, we felt very negatively about those, th those papers. I've talked a lot about what they didn't have them, in them. I think it's really important to say what they did have in them. And what they had in them often was a vision of um, very simple own provisioning of food. So food acquisition was generally seen as coming from own production um, in rural areas. And what that seems to ignore are the very complex changes that have taken place in the way people um, acquire food in low and middle income countries, the import penetration, the changes in food preferences, um, you know, the sort of um, the very um, substantial way that food markets themselves have changed over time. Um, and in terms of food production, again, we get a very simple story. Food producers are, you know, men or women, um, they're understood in a very simplistic way, they don't, they're not seen as hiring labour because we have no story about labour in these um, documents. And it's not clear, you know, um, how, um, how the farm household is supposed to benefit. So unlike this picture of what goes on in the household, who does the cooking, you know, who's got the responsibility, often that side of the story isn't in the policy documents. And it's very interesting. And so the concern that I have is that it ignores, you know, all the rich work we do here, we do elsewhere, on the, these very changes. So changes both to food production that we'll be very well aware of the differentiation that's happening among farmers. You know, the the the, um, the rise of large farms, the increasing landlessness, and also the changes around, you know, diets and the way people acquire food. So what I wanted to end with is to talk about why that might be. And actually, I don't have a full set of answers to that. I have some, 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 some of my own views on that. And I think it would be really interesting to you know, consider why this is. And for me, one of the reasons, or one of the ways we could say, well, why are policy documents so lacking in all the evidence that actually is coming out of academia, for example, or, or from practice? You know, why do policy documents lack um, this kind of um, complexity and, and um, depth. And one kind of answer could be that policy documents have to have a simple message. It has to be a simple message which can be used to, to, harness, um, to um, harness political will. So you could think of policy documents as having an advocacy role and consequently often they're simplified. Um, so that's, that is one kind of of answer, but I think there are other reasons that are added to that, and it's because of the, the very nature of the things that we're talking about. Um, when we think ab about gender, this is written about in so many other areas, um, but when we think about the way that gender is operationalized in policy, it's often done in a way that gives kind of technical, apolitical solutions. Um, if Jasmine had been here, she would have talked about the work she's doing around um, sexual and reproductive health. And one of the really interesting things there is when we talk about policy around sexual and reproductive health, it's far easier to tell messages around maternal health than it is to pick up other parts of the sexual and reproductive health agenda and talk about them. And so there's an, it's interesting that particular kinds of gendered messages sell more easily than others. Um, 
and the politics of thinking about women as, as farmers, standalone individual farmers, is a lot less um, complicated than thinking about gender relations between women and men in a particular area and dealing with the land tenure problems or, these, or the issues about the intra-household division of labour, who does the work, is more political and it's more complex. And I think that's particularly true when we think about um, farm workers. So this sort of discussion about the landless and about wage workers becomes a m far more complex political proposition because if I start talking about the, con the conditions of, um, of uh, wage workers on, on farms, that's instantly a more complex message than it is to say we'll help everybody grow their own food. So for me, this isn't just about the need for simple messages. This is about the need for um, a certain kind of apolitical message and, um, and also potentially about the need to gloss over quite deep divisions in the way that agricultural policy benefits particular groups of rural people. So I was going to finish then to say, you know, to, to, so summing up, you know, I've talked about the narrowness of the concepts that are used there, and the, you know that lack of the depth that we will, that that we might expect to be there, given the recognition of how rapidly rural areas and diets are changing um, in low and middle income countries. Um, and um, we talked a little bit about the the um, rationale for that. Why might that be? But the issue is what that means. Is it, th does that mean that our beautiful new agri-health policies will be ineffective? Are they going to be useful policies? And for me, the biggest concern is the lack of consideration of how complex um, eating patterns are. <laughs> this issue of, well, how do people acquire food? How do the, the prices of food markets change? Is a far more complex issue in a world in which, you know, Food is so integrated. Um, so I'm going to end there, and I hope the audience will help me find answers to some of these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. That was amazing. I, I, I don't know about you, but my mind was whizzing around there, very, very stimulated, and really thinking through about the similarities between what were two apparently completely different talks uh, actually had so many things that were that what they were complementary between them and I, I was just at a meeting this morning uh, on a, a report that I'm part of on food system agriculture food systems and nutrition policies and um, a very very senior uh, uh, gentleman who was there he's a lovely guy lovely lovely man as I said very senior and we were talking about the issues that have just been talked about now um, and he said isn't the answer just to teach women how to cook and, you know, and he said it in such a nice gentlemanly way that was so kindly and well meant um, but without really a clue about all of these politics and all of these dilemmas that we experience as individuals and societies and in the political environments that somehow there was this easy answer that we just need to pat 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 teach women how to cook uh, so really, really fascinating uh, presentations um, there, and, and I'd love to invite questions from the audience for, for both our speakers. Who would like to start? Uh, Miriam Greenwood. Um, coming from a similar generation to Rosie, I'd just like to add a, a slightly different perspective. In, in my um, women's consciousness raising group of the rise of the 70s women's movement, um, there were two of us who never stopped being very, very interested in food and have continued to be so. And be, it's a base, key basis of our friendship. And the motive behind it is just enjoyment of eating. Mm -hmm. So it's the pleasure of eating, it's sheer greed. Instead of it just being, I know, of course, on a day to day basis, and especially families with juggling two jobs and children, it, it, is, a, it is a logistical problem. And I don't, know, I don't know how people manage to do it. But all the same, o over and above that, the motivation has got to be that you eat so much better, you enjoy it so much more when you cook it yourself. Other than all the cuisine kind of things, there's very little that you can buy that is going to give you as much pleasure and satisfaction 
it's so repeatable. So I think some of the answer has got to be in just thinking of food in that kind of way. Um, thank you both for the presentations. They were great. Um, question for Deborah. I was wondering when you were talking about the female workers and you mentioned that you were doing um, uh, journals, dietary journals for them. Were they cooking at home? Were they, did you interview them? Did they talk about that aspect of their life, whether they enjoyed it or whether it was just another thing to do, a second shift? Sure. I mean, I don't know who. Um, I mean, yes, I couldn't. I couldn't agree with you more. But I, I mean, I think that for a lot of people uh, now, um, you know, a lot of work we do, for instance, about looking at fast food takeaways. For a lot of people, if they don't have a table, they don't have room. That's where they go, even to have a family meal. Um, it, it's such a. If we could just have people really enjoy food, the chances are they'd eat really well. But the truth is that people are a long way away from that, and it, all the, uh, you know, the new sort of reading and understanding of obesity is it's saying that 50% of the population, you know, politicians will like to tell you at the moment that the the stats are levelling off, and indeed they are in terms of pure numbers. But what's happening is that the kind of half of the population that's got the message that food really matters and what you shove in your body matters are fine, and half of the population, it's getting much worse. And so the question is, A, how do we get to that with this double thing of how do we get people to spend the time again to cook, learn to cook, spend the money, because actually, if you're just thinking about getting full and getting a quick hit, the cheapest way you can acquire 700 calories or 1,000 calories is to buy a very cheap pizza or to go to the chicken and chip shop. Um, to get away from that is a really long haul. And as I say, I, I see very little sign um, of working guys stepping towards this particular challenge. And I do see that it's, once again, it's women who are saying, we'll do it, we'll take on this. And you're right, though, you're right about enjoyment. I mean, food is wonderful, and you sort of wish everybody could share that because it's an incredibly... It's a lovely thing that actually is available to everybody, unlike lots of other things. I'm going to answer Maria's question somewhat as well, because I think it comes to this issue of what is pleasure. And what I found, so for example, mm. I'm doing some work in Ghana with um, children of secondary school age, and we're looking at what those children eat. And what's very interesting is that those, those are kids that, um, that generally have at least two cans of soda a day. And when you begin to, to sort of break down why that is and what's the pleasure, it kind of brings us back to the multiple meanings that food has. The pleasure of food comes from lots of things. And we have to think about what's our what are our aspirations and how are they created. And in a lot of the places where I work, in Ghana, in Ethiopia, I'm thinking of work in Mozambique as well, people's food preferences are affected by advertising Absolutely. and by what they see as desirable goods. And, you know, those are often, in those sorts of settings, I mean, it differs a lot where you are, often those are about s soda, they're about biscuits, that they're about, you know, the corn puff crisps, yeah, um, and particular kinds of spices, um, you know, the kind of processed spices and that's what gives people pleasure to be able to provide them for their family and their children and uh, you know we did a survey actually a, a PhD student of mine did a survey looking at what women thought was healthy food for children in northern Mozambique and um, th it was uh, um, biscuits and soda and that's because these things are advertised as being good for you and good for ch you know good sources of food clean and healthy and they're seeing as being um, modern and mm -hmm. they are aspirational as a result. So I think we have to think a lot about where pleasure comes from. And that's quite hard because we're doing it in an environment where a lot of other kinds of things try to tell us what is good to eat and what should be pleasurable for us. You know, advertising tries to do that. And so, yeah, so it's, you know, your one voice, one kind of lone voice in a sea of advertising that's trying to make people think that other things are pleasurable and good. 
Um, so it's, it is really difficult. Um, the question about food diaries in, in, in Ethiopia. So I, yes, I'd love to have this conversation with Rosie because it, it's exactly true that one of the reasons we did this research is because there's a very strong belief that a major factor causing dietary change in low and middle income countries is the fact that women are working <coughs> far more outside the house than they were previously. And, um, and actually, interestingly, we did find some of that was true, that actually working women did cook in different ways and did cook less, because they didn't have time for you know, lengthy food preparation. And they were far more dependent on buying mm. processed food, food that could be eaten really quickly. Um, and often had very long working days. So, so this wasn't just about women working. And often, I was saying to Rosie before, for me, the change in food practices was, wasn't so much the, you know, wasn't the outcome of women working. In a way, women working was caused because people were already unable to grow their own food, were already dependent on having income to purchase food. So it was more a cause, you know, women working was more a, a cause than a consequence. Yeah, yeah. Um, but at the same time, it was leading to further shifts, and, you know, people depending far more and having very long. Um, days of paid work and on top of that having high burdens of unpaid work in the house also. So, so yeah, not positive joyful stories of cooking either, yeah. Um, I mean, just, just to add to that, I mean, it's interesting the way, you know, you say that all that advertising gets targeted at women about what to feed their baby and all that mm. kind of thing. I mean, I, someone gave me a, a, a document that had been circulated inside the baby milk uh, world of all the different manufacturers, and it was the most chilling thing I'd almost ever seen. And it was ju it was talking about how very little point in Western world now trying to pr you know increase sales because mm -hmm. people had got the I got back to the idea that breastfeeding was good, even though in fact only whatever it is two percent of people in this country breastfeed for up to six months. But but they were saying they were just saying our big market is China. Women in China will do whatever you want. Uh, and that, that woman in Australia, the richest woman in Australia who owns all those tin mines, she's now turned masses of her land over to producing, to doing dairy cows. Same with New Zealand, same with Ireland. I mean, all pushing the, the baby milk industry. Um, and it just is an absolute thing of how to get women to think that this is, in fact, better for their children in some ways. Because even if you're selling it as a convenience, because you want mm. to do something else, there is an implied message in all of that that somehow it's better, I think. Please give your name when you ask your question. Thank you. And, uh, Deborah, uh, I really appreciate uh, your uh, presentation. My name is Sergio, I'm from Brazil. I'm an academic visitor here in the CFP. Um, um, uh, actually, I, I, I would like to see again the, the name of the international institutions because I couldn't catch if the World Food Program is there. Uh, I couldn't, I, I saw World Bank, IFPRI, Defeat, and, well, yeah, it's not there. Uh, the, my first question is why World Food Program is not there? It's uh, because from all this uh, big international organization, World Food Program should be, at least in my perception the uh, the leading institution to work with this with this kind of thing because they 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 they, they approach food issues nutrition uh, uh, has their mandate so that's the first point wh why they are absent and second well uh, sorry if to 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 refer like that but um, uh, my question or, or or just to ask you if you um, uh, hypothesis what not uh, was not uh, uh, a little bit uh, I would say uh, uh, the, the point is why expect that this international or, or, or organization should refer to gender mm. issues I, I think that was expected that they they have nothing to say about that because we know how they deal especially World Bank and all these big reports they always uh, um, they dedicate two or three paragraphs just to just to say, well, let's uh, let's make a reference uh, because we have to talk about flowers and then okay, gender have to be there. So uh, uh, it's uh, that's the point. Uh, but uh, about your research um, issues, I would like to um, ask you about another hypothesis uh, that is uh, related to migration. If we look in poor countries. Uh, most of these poor, poor countries, for instance, I make some research in Cape Verde in, in Africa, 
a lot of uh, a lot of women that uh, stay uh, behind, stay in the families, uh, because the the men migrate to the Netherlands to the United States. Mm -hmm. So this changed completely the way and the relation between food, because there is the international remittances of money and cash. There is indirect ac access to cash, and uh, by the other side, as you said, uh, the tenor relation with land access is is very it's very vulnerable. Well, then you here you have uh, the, the perfect combination in order to use money to buy food. And the, and the food that is available is not the food anymore that is possible to grow. So the, the, my question or my hypothesis would be that there is a different social relation between land and, and access to money, cash, not uh, 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 to, to these women. And this is maybe behind of the point that they uh, go more to access uh, pre-cooked or pre-prepared or junk food, I would say, and not cook the food by, by themselves. I don't know what you think about that. Hello, um, my name is Catherine Parker. I'm just ex going through one of those changes of career things. I've been a civil servant for a long time and just set up a food business. Um, but I'm interested in where those little opportunities or angles might be, Rosie, in terms of what you're talking about, of trying to avoid the return. And what it makes me think of is going back to Wendy Craig in Butterflies, for those people who remember a, a tragic woman figure serving up continually yeah. to her two sons, as I now do, even though I have boobies, things that are slightly burnt and which they look at and go, Mum, really, what are you? What do you do? Just what I'm interested in is what scope there is for our institutions rather than our families at the end of a tired day to be the point which we experience healthy food. So a bit like the, the nutrition provided by the workers. So in city hall, in schools and hospitals, to make the midday meal the point at which we get most of that nutrition and stop putting pressure on ourselves to do that in the home at the end of the day, which I think is a more gendered space, even though, of course, mm -hmm. there's a lot of those dynamics in institutions as well. Do you want to, well, Sorry. Deborah's question what came first, so. Thank you. So yes, Sergio, it would have been really good to look at WFE. The reason we looked particularly at the ones we did was because we were interested in the way that this new agri-health policy was being constructed. And often that um, has happened among donors who were very focused on agricultural projects. And so, it was, um, and so, um, so what's happened is you've moved from having agricultural policy to having agri-health policy. I have to say there's the, the issue of to what extent it's really agri-health because I think, to, and it's something that Karina has written about, you know, there's a wide spectrum of, um, of, re of interactions between agriculture and health, you know, occupational health of workers, the um, exposure to pesticides, um, you know, a much wider interaction and actually a number of these policies tend to focus on agri-nutrition, so I often call them agri-nutrition policies. Um, so that's so that's why. But you're right. It would be it's, it, it, that's a we we could go back and look at those particular documents. Um, so why should we expect you know the World Bank or others to write about gender? I think there are two reasons. You could expect them to do some lip service to gender because they know that women form the majority, both of farmers and farm mm -hmm. workers. Um, but the second reason you could expect women, um, you know, gender to be mentioned is that there's the very clear evidence that gender. Re relations fundamentally affect food outcomes in the household. I mean, you know, we've been talking about it in lots of different ways, but, you know, there's very clear evidence that, um, or, or we're beginning to see clear evidence that, you know, in countries, for example, where food out, where, where nutritional outcomes haven't improved as much as agricultural output, you know, uh, in India, for example, m rapid agricultural output growth, but look at at nutritional improvement, that hasn't improved in the same way. And one of the reasons we speculate is because the status of women within the household hasn't necessarily improved in, in the same way. So, I mean, so y there are lots of reasons why um, you might expect gender to be mentioned in these documents. Um, 
The third issue about, you know, what's driving this, you're quite right, international remittances. I could do a really long list. I think among us we could add a long series of factors that are actually leading to greater monetization and greater food purchasing. I'd also like to add a big factor in sub-Saharan Africa and the countries where I work has been the, you know, fantastic um, change in the provision of social grants, benefits, pensions, child benefits in a, in a number of low-income countries. But that has had the effect then of increasing um, people's ability to sh shift to purchase food. And um, colleague at SOAS, Lizzie Hull, has written about this beautifully for, s for South Africa. And this is not always a bad thing. I mean, this is about, um, and often this is about women having more income and deciding where to spend it. And I think we would all agree that that can, be a, that can be an excellent thing. The issue is that the food environments in which they spend that income means that, and the kinds of advertising that affect their preferences mean that often the diets that result from that are worrying in terms of their um, nutritional content. So, so yes, there's been a greater monetization. Um, that's, that's all really interesting. Um, yes, I think that that's actually a terrifically good and interesting idea. Um, it, it's made me think when you were talking about, um, I mean, that great institution, the hospital, and we've been doing quite a lot of work lately on hospitals, and actually they're a tragedy. And, and, and they really make you want to slightly weep, um, not slightly weep, like weep openly. Um, I mean, last week I was in both Bart's and the Middlesex, which is just huge. It's sort of a whole block, and in Great Ormond Street. And you know, they're absolutely swamped with sweets, chips. Um, the choices of food are very limited. Um, the, co the trolleys that go round just sell. I mean, G Great Ormond Street's amazing. It's just selling sweets. And in Bart's, where they, they said, we have the highest incident in this hospital of maternal diabetes. They give them sweets and biscuits. And apparently the someone, a, a dietitian who I was talking to, who gets very angry about this, was saying that she'd been talking to a nurse who worked on a diabetes ward who would say to her, well, why don't you have a squash fly biscuit because it's got fruit in it with your coffee, milky, sugary coffee at 11. So there's a kind of, and then again, what you get into in, in again in the hospital is that overnight, um, there is nothing to eat apart from what you can get out of the vending machine. There is nothing. And that's true of, almost all hospitals. I mean, I think and hope now that you know, the NHS is just walking towards saying that they can have some extra grants for starting to change this. And we're quite optimistic because in London, it, at least it's something there's not too many of them maybe, and we've got a big conference coming up in April, if anyone wants to come, can come, um, to try to, to, to start to work this around. But when you see that, that even within a hospital, with people who are in that hospital, to a large part because of problems with food. Um, you, you know, you really have to wonder, but if you can, one of the great things about the school meal being back is that there is a really high standard of food. Henry Dimbleby and John Vincent really pushed and pushed and pushed to get that as part of the deal, not just a free school lunch, but a school lunch with standards. And that is, that is really what, what it's been about, that, you get used to having one good thing and then you really have a good chance of saying, actually, I want to repeat that one good thing into, into another thing. Um, and yes, we need to put it through institutions. I know because um, Jamie Oliver's worked with them and various people like, companies like Google, okay, looking very much at their bottom line because they can see they, they, you know, that if they keep their employees healthy, um, they'll take fewer days off work. But they're putting in incredibly good food and cooking lessons which they're starting to provide to all staff for free um, because they realize actually the staff will take days off if their children are sick. So they kind of, you know, there's always a bottom line for everything. But yes, within the institutions, the, the better you can do it, the better. Yeah. Yeah, um, a further question here. Yes, um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, oh, I'm Vera from the uh, up here from the Brighton and Hope Food Partnership. Oh hi! <laughs> oh hello. So you're doing Sugar Smart. We are. It's really yeah, it's, yeah, so it's cool. really exciting. And I, I too was really saddened. It was my first visit to a hospital earlier this year. Luckily, after six years here in the NHS, I was equally 
shocked, but I, sh I guess I shouldn't have been surprised. So yeah, good stuff. Um, I'm trying, still trying to formulate my question, I suppose, it's to both speakers. Um, I'm really kind of inspired by some of the solutions that um, I think nationally and also what I know locally in Brighton and Hove, we're exploring um, this whether eating meals, uh, sharing meals together, whether communal eating can perhaps offer some of the solutions that, um, you know, it doesn't surprise me that uh, poor nutrition and sort of this kind of this cultural uh, culture of food, eating food in an isolated way that, you know, I, I kind of feel like in, in, intrinsically they feel connected to me. Um, so, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of like interested what that might look like here in the UK, uh, whether this, this idea of shared meals um, to kind of um, take away those barriers of, oh, I should do this or I don't have time for that, you know, where we share and support each other so we can do more with what less we have. Um, and whether there is something in there that could perhaps impact, you know, global food and nutrition policies, you know, is there a space for that uh, in countries that are effectively learning some of the terrible lessons that we've already internalized about some of these aspirations, about some of this, you know, do something simpler, do something quicker, do it away from others, and get going. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm just wondering if we could kind of activate that both locally here and globally. I don't know. Hi. Yeah, I um, agree completely with um, what you said, Rosie, about getting people back into the kitchen. Oh, hi, sorry. My name's Julia. Just uh, here to, for the discussion. Um, so I, I agree with the idea that we need to get people back into cooking, get people back in touch with where our food comes from. Um, I'm, I also love cooking, so it's, I'm completely behind this. I also um, kind of share your your perspective on consumer power, using our, our power as consumers to make choices in the supermarket, um, albeit a restricted choice, obviously. Um, but I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on, you know, uh, as great as it would be if, if everyone loved cooking, I, I really see obstacles to that. I mean, just sort of informally, people will say, oh, well, I just, just not something that I like. I just don't really care about it. Can we put it all on the consumers to kind of change the food system or do we do mm. we need to kind of shift it? Um, can, can we expect everyone to enjoy this um, or should we kind of put it on, on other actors, as it were, to uh, fix our food system, I guess? Thank you. <laughs> to go first. <laughs> That's such a million dollar question, that last one. Um, no, you're completely right. We can't put it all on the consumer. It, it's why food is so so unbelievably complicated and, and really difficult because whose responsibility is it that we end up eating like this, which came first, the chicken and the egg, you know, the feminist rocking down the road or the kind of, you know, the person with the best curry and Marks and Spencers with their meals. And it's a kind of extraordinary collusion that we have all taken part in um, and getting pe making people responsible is only one part of it because the part where that is just not true is that if we accepted that the reason we're in a mess with food is because of individual choice and that we made the wrong choices which is what the Sun newspaper would have you believe and coca-cola and corporations then we have to accept that um, whatever it is now, we're at 60% of this population, 60% of America, somehow in 30 years lost their will to live, lost their will to control their appetite. So that obviously is rubbish. What changed was the environment. So the picking, I mean, McKinsey, the McKinsey report on the state of obesity, which came out in the autumn of 2014, and is still a very, very golden, wonderful document, because they did it, they, they isolated 80 different interventions that they thought needed to happen to start to straighten up the food system. I would say that is, that is just a starting block. I mean, and, in, and today, literally why we've all been sitting here, I mean, George Osborne has done one of them, which is to introduce a sugar tax. Uh, I'm not completely sure of all the ins and outs of it, but it's, it's not coming in for two years, but it is the first step 
of the government saying, hey, we've got a problem, at least agreeing there is a problem there. Um, we buy food for all sorts of different reasons and in all sorts of different ways. We latest stuff coming out of Public Health England showed that 40% uh, of all the food bought in Britain is bought on promotion, which is quite staggering when you think about it. That is bought on two for the price of one, you know, buy it by five o'clock and get it free, whatever it is. Um, we are way ahead of any other European country. Um, the modus operandi of the food industry in Britain is sell in bulk, sell it cheap. The modus operandi of all capitalism, where the food system is concerned, sell more made from ever cheaper ingredients. Kind of disaster. Well, we all know it's a disaster. But it comes at you from every which way, whether you're sitting in the hospital watching the trolley go by, which is, in Great Ormond Street's case, is full of those milk bottle things, those little jammy little sweets. Um, or whether you're watching television. Uh, or whether you're being you know, seduced as a child into doing this, or whether you're sitting in the cinema with... It's everywhere. So you have to try to exercise everything. My personal belief is that you need the government to move in terms of the big things, like bigger sugar taxes. I'm quite sure whatever it is, it's not big enough. Um, big starts to say you can't promote food in that in the way this way to kids. Really, really clamping down on that. Um, really starting to change the, of some things to do with food pricing, because food pricing is appalling. I mean, so the OECD report looked at, a couple of years ago, fruit and vegetables since the year 2000 have rough, roughly doubled, whereas processed food has roughly halved. Um, we need laws that will help with fast food takeaways, having the rights to halve their prices between 3 and 3.30 for the kids coming out of school. You can quickly, you can snaffle up 800 calories for 50p around that. You know, we live in this environment, so we need laws to help, but we also need culture shifts as well, and that goes back to how do you get into the schools. You can look at, like, Finland, an extraordinary country where they really have done incredible things about helping people to change their eating habits. Um, if you look at smoking, smoking needed pricing, law, restriction, and culture. And it started to work. And um, food is obviously much more complicated, but all those things have to happen. And you also need all the things like the small businesses on the ground, all the community projects, which can then slowly knit together to try to restore it. So it's very, very complicated. Um, but you're quite right, we cannot put it all on the consumer and we will fail if we do. Similarly though, we will fail if we put it all on the government. It's the thing that's one of the very rare things that needs everybody in it. Um, I'm very interested also in what the, you, Vera? Um, the um, isolated eating is really interesting because I think it does completely, you, I mean there is nothing sadder than those books called Cooking for One. Uh, I mean, I remember after my mum died, my dad had books called Cook. He did learn to cook then, which I admired him for very much. But cooking for one is very sad. It, cooking was never really meant to be for one. And um, isolated eating is not fun. I mean, it means you snack, you eat on the move, you don't sit down, you don't share a drink with someone and enjoy it. And again, the industry has absolutely done come up trumps. There's masses and masses of things you can have for eating and grazing. And um, I think communal eating is a really nice thing. And again, there's tons of wonderful food projects around in London, whether it's with homeless people or people on restricted incomes. I mean, we, were, we had a meeting yesterday morning of the economic um, department at the GLA, and they were looking at the, uh, the impact of the restriction, the restriction, the cutback, the complete cutback of both Meals on Wheels and lunch clubs. And malnutrition is now the leading cause for going into hospital, old people in London. Unbelievable. Um, because we had this short-sightedness of you know, cutting back on things. Lunch clubs were a brilliant idea. Got people out of the house, got them enjoying themselves, got them having a decent meal. So yes, I'm very, very in favor of that. And the more one can do it back, you know, more one can come back of this. Again, one's up against the biggest and smartest capitalist country companies in the world who, um, for whom there is no markup on a bit of broccoli. Just a 
bit of broccoli, you can mark it up 10p, you know, slather it in white sauce and do all that, you mark it up 100%. You know, it's a very, it's, they're a really big enemy. I like having an enemy, but sometimes they quite defeat me. Um, so, to take those questions in that t in that same order, to you know, to sort of look back, you know, to look first at consumer power, and you know, I couldn't agree more with what Rosie said. I mean, uh, you know, policy has to take has to go with consumers, but it but it has to be far more than that, and um, and. I think that you know this issue about what's happening in terms of changes in diets in lower middle income countries I mean Karina would be far better placed to you know talk about this that, than I am but they, you know the rapid rises in diabetes in heart disease and and in certain cancers is a real evidence of you know um, following a pattern of um, consumption of sh you know salt sugar and um, and um, fat in processed food and at the same time those are those are countries that have a large number um, of people who still suffer from um, for, from undernutrition, from a lack of um, calories. So um, the need for very active government policy, both at the level of countries and internationally, is crucial. Um, and I think that's where the question is: you know, what can be done to you know counter the power of of large corporations who, who, who earn a lot from precisely selling um, high markup food in in countries with an expanding consumer base, and uh, it's a it, it's a difficult question, a very but it's the question for the moment, which doesn't mean we don't ignore preferences, um, but um, but we have to see them in context. How are they shaped? What is the advertising? Why do people want to spend their little bit of extra income on a soda? What's that about? Um, and, and I think unless we get to the bottom of that, we will just be recreating the problems we have in northern countries in the south. Bill. Do you see actually any evidence of governments seeing what's coming towards them and doing something at this point? Well, I think that there is some evidence of that, and ag and again, I mean, you know, there are people here who would be kind of w w really well placed to um, talk about that. Um, Karina and I and others here are involved in the uh, in the Leverhulme Centre for Integrated Research on Agriculture and Health, and we have an annual conference, and you get people from all around the world coming, and you do c um, have uh, fantastic papers. Um, I'm thinking of the paper from um, the paper on policy on in. Um, Vanuatu, I think it was, where they tried to ban um, uh, pork flaps, and I mean, so you, you do have some um, attempts at, um, you know, really proactive policy, and it's precisely because people are looking at, you know, policymakers in those countries are well aware of what's coming, um, but I think it's difficult. I think the policy spaces for that are quite closed down, um, and it's very complex. But I mean, there'll be others here who might be, you know, I can only comment really on the countries that I work in. <laughs> And in those countries, actually, no, I see very limited evidence for a lot of reasons. And, and are they, like, you know, are, are they in the in the position where they're, I mean, I'm trying to remember what thing, uh, what film I saw about a, a Coca-Cola hut somewhere in the middle of absolutely bloody nowhere mm -hmm. that was providing internet access and, and free Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they would kind of welcomed it with open arms because it meant a lot of money. And it, you could go there and go on all these laptops and get connected. So in the countries in which I work, that's exactly how I'd characterize um, what's happening in rural areas. That, um, and this isn't just about supermarkets, the rise of supermarkets. What you see in, in formal shops, in, in sort of spas or shops, in the sellers with the bicycles who go yeah. around, you know, Nestle's. full of, yeah, and it's full of Nestle products. It's full of processed products, you know, that are coming. So um, processed goods are penetrating in the deepest rural areas. I was fascinated, actually, in Ethiopia, um, the two big spice companies, perhaps I shouldn't name them because mm. we're being filmed, you know, are making massive inroads in Ethiopia, the land of spices. You know, you go to the, the, their fabulous spice markets and you can now see these tiny sachets that have been marketed by these two large companies. Um, and, and because th and they make them really small so people can afford them. So people can now buy the same spices that, that we can. Um, and there are really interesting reasons why that happens. But, um, but so, so I, yes, consumer power is not enough and um, we've
proved really difficult at changing attitudes towards food and having it have it had an impact for the mass of the population in northern countries. And yet we're hoping to use the same thing about changing incentives to solve the nutritional crisis which is emerging in southern countries. It's interesting, isn't it? We haven't learned lesson. Um, and, but to, 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 to pick up Vera's point on communal eating, I think that is a really important point. And you're right, you know, what's the quality of, what's the quality of school meals in low and middle income countries? What's the, you know, what kind of other communal eating? I mean, the ex example I started with was the provision of um, lunch for farm workers. And interestingly, those <coughs> farm workers had a much improved dietary diversity score, one of the ways that we assess you know, the quality of um, food consumption. And so that lunch was having a big impact. Mm -hmm. It would have been great if they could have decided to take it home. It would have been better still if they'd had a decent wage. That yeah. would have meant that it wasn't yeah. a trade-off between feeding themselves or feeding their children. So, yeah. Thank you. Just uh, to pick up on the points made about policy development in other countries. So, um, uh, the analysis that I did recently on a set of 200 policies, so there are a lot of policies in other countries, but not a single one uh, to promote healthy eating, but not a single one was in a low-income country. Mm. Um, so Chile has a tax, a sugar tax already. Mexico has a sugar tax. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there are countries who have done these, but they tend to be on the higher income range, and lower income countries haven't done anything. But then uh, South, um, South Africa has a childhood obesity strategy, which came out in December 2015, which is quite strong. And, and Kenya is just, uh, just about to produce a childhood obesity strategy. So it's, it's, it's coming up, it's just as soon as they start to try and do things. How like tough is South Africa? What, what does it say? Um, it, it's, it's, it's actually quite a decent strategy, but I can't remember the specifics. I mean, they, they, they have restricting marketing to kids and stuff like that, but I don't know yeah. whether it's just an idea or whether it's actually the legislative process has started. But South Africa has mandatory limits on salt. Uh, on salt in the way that we don't in the UK, for example. So you do get stronger uh, policies in some other countries, and so which is, which is kind of interesting. But I was thinking actually about the comment about communal eating, and I was teaching yesterday and giving the example of Belo Horizonte, uh, which has a, it's a city in Brazil um, that has uh, its, its urban policy, its urban food policy, is, is focused a lot on a point of retail and communal eating. And I'm just wondering whether there's been any evaluation of that on actually the role of women and how it's uh, affected the dynamics of women in the home and cooking because it provides very, very cheap, low-cost meals that are universal access in, in these so-called popular restaurants. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're very, very, uh, they are very popular indeed. So uh, I'm going to go and ask my colleague about that mm. uh, later. It should be uh, interesting. So any, um, any other questions? Well, I think I'll... Sorry, I didn't ask one more question. Yeah, I... Sure, yeah. <laughs> So it's Raquel from the Centre for Food Policy. Um, so when Deborah mentioned the small packages of spices, it reminded me of um, a meeting on food poverty that um, Rosie mentioned that you were working with the one pound shops, trying to convince them to sell small packages of different foods because right. more and more people were going to the one pound shop to, to buy food. Um, so I wanted to ask you about whether that developed or something mm -hmm. happened, whether uh, um, was the gender dimension of food poverty in London. Um, also, we have the, uh, mayor, the mayor elections coming up. <laughs> have you yeah. spoken to any of the candidates about their food policy strategies and their gender strategies? And one question for Deborah. Sorry, I got lots of questions. <laughs> um, when you spoke to these um, female farmers, did they share any concerns about the environment, about climate change, or did they have, it sounds like they had more immediate worries and concerns? Um, and a question for all of us, are we being realistic asking men to cook when they're also really tired and they don't have time? Don't we all just have to go part-time? <laughs> mm. Well, um, um, yes. I d Starting where, where, where you began, over, um, yeah, I did go to see the head of pound shop uh, to propose that they should do a pound bag of a healthy kind of food. They said no. It was too difficult for them to do. They were going to carry on selling sweets. Um, so that failed. But then, then not long after that, I found a guy who, who runs a thing called the company shop. 
And uh, out of that came the first um, social supermarket in London. And we just put through, literally this week, we just put through the money to start another three. And I've taken tons of MPs down to this shop and uh, policy makers. And in fact, I think they're going to start springing up all around. And how the, yes, so how these work is there was a guy, I'll try and tell this quickly. There was a guy in, um, up in near Leeds, Bradford, and when he was an 18-year-old boy, he was trying to look for a, a job, and he was in an area where there was lots and lots and lots of food companies, and he started in a biscuit company, and he, he went to the manager, and he said, okay, you're chucking out all these biscuits that are broken or in some way not suitable for sale. And instead of saying, will you give them to me, he said, I will buy them from you. I'm not only will I buy them, but I will come and take them away. So he removed at the same time a problem of disposal and he created a bit of income. So he was buying them, let's say, for 1p and selling them for 10p. This was in 1969 or thereabouts. And from that developed this huge business. Uh, and today up in the north, up in that part of Yorkshire, he has some huge supermarkets, which uh, if you are work in any of the companies you're allowed to go to, or he extended it a few years ago to people in the emergency services were given. And what you get is a card, um, which is I extremely, um, you can't, I mean, basically very much yours, got your fingerprints on it, everything, you can't pass it to anybody else. And you can go in and you can shop for sort of 20, 30p in the pound or thereabouts, and you can buy everything you can think of under the sun. And, what's in, and it looks like a normal supermarket when you walk in, and then after a minute you realize it's not like a local store because next, you have Sainsbury's next to Waitrose, next to Morrison's, next to Aldi, all the own product stuff, and every other label you can think of is all stacked together, plus fresh fruit, plus fresh vegetables. So he, um, what we did with him, they had one, they started one up north and we brought one down here. We give people, if you're on every means tested um, indicator of low income and poverty, you can apply to be a member of, of this. It's literally a club. Uh, you get six months when you can shop there. And part of the deal is that you learn to cook, um, you bring your kids in and get them to cook, um, and you get help. And you, you sort of submit to, well, you sign on to get some help to see if you can get your life back in shape. And what it's saying is, for this six months, we take off all the pressure about feeding your family. You don't have to go to the food bank. We'll make sure you're okay, and we'll make sure it's right. So we have loads of members. Um, it really works. What's brilliant is that you pay the cost of setting it up, and that's it. We employ 12 people. Uh, it's a proper social enterprise. Every single penny goes back. Uh, I took Frank Field um, when he'd done the Poverty Commission down there, and he's got the lottery bid in for 12 to go around the country. So yeah, it's been, um, it's been great, but pound shop were absolutely useless. Um, the mayors, um, come see, come sa. I mean, it's, it's a bit soppy as far as I can see at the moment. Um, it's not that there isn't some level of food policy, but despite um, them having been given really good talks by um, a guy called Danny Rutter, who's at the moment heading up across all the councils, the London obesity strategy, who's a brilliant guy, uh, and various other people. The agendas are not, they're lacking in ambition, <laughs> to put it mildly. But we wait to see. We've only got, we're, we're literally, this is the last, what's it, Wednesday. We've just got Thursday and Friday is all that's left in the way of Forrester's administration. And then it goes into what's called PERDA. And at that point, you'll start to see much more of the manifestos coming through. But it's a, it's a watch this space. I mean, I just want to make sure they don't go backwards. Um, I mean, Zach is proposing spending money on uh, little farms in schools, but they will be in the outer boroughs. And from my thinking about this, <laughs> that's very nice to do. But there's already a lot of money in this space. You can raise private money for things to do in schools. We put. I got a million quid off the lottery to put gardens into London schools. You know, we're getting our way around it. We get given money from Whole Foods, from uh, Seeds of Change, from Mars, from Innocent, from this, from that. All people, lots of people want to do this. Actually, if you're talking about, in my view, public money, it should be going into much, much tougher areas of policy, like 
um, you know, a project we did to bring something called the, on food poverty, to bring something called the Bounty Bonds, which were begun in America, in Boston, and they were a fantastically brilliant idea uh, that mothers, pregnant women and mothers of tiny kids on food stamps could double their money if they shopped at the farmer's markets. And it's now across every state in America and practically every city called different things, called New York dollars, bounty bonds, Washington something. Anyway, um, and we had that going, sponsored by a charity that we found. Um, we've been putting money into it. I mean, it's fantastic. It, it works through markets, because we don't have the farmer's markets, and we work it through children's centers. But uh, I, things like that seem to me a much better use of public money to try to say these pilots work, these are actually really helping the diet of people who, God, they need to eat healthily. And we, know, we all know now what the evidence is if pregnant mums eat really badly. It, it's really bad for the kids in the future. So um, I hope that we'll see that. I, but I could rant about this for a long time, so I'll shut up because I'll say something. I'll say something I'll regret. <laughs> and you're being filmed as well. <laughs> um, female farm workers and the environment. The answer I'm going to give you isn't going to be one that perhaps you'd like, but um, in, in this particular um, place, it's a place called Holetta, the one that I was talking about, this, this very particular piece of research. Um, this was an area where there'd been a lot of land loss, and partly it had been due to things that we might call land grabbing, okay? You know, large companies coming in and using land, but there were a, n a number of <coughs> other practices and other reasons why, why these women who were, work who were engaging in farm work didn't have land to grow their own food, and often this was a factor. And um, for some of them, um, one of the factors had been that a, a large area of um, woodland had been demarcated as, um, as um, environmentally protected land, and previously they'd sold fuel wood from that land, and that was now possible. So that was now not possible. So actually, this particular group, to the extent they mentioned the environment, actually it was they were talking about the negative impacts of that bit of, of that piece of environmental management. And I guess what that makes us all remember is that, you know, for for desperately poor people, um, some of the protections that we would want to put in around the environment will have negative consequences and we have to plan that in. Um, so that's the way that the environment came up in those sorts of um, conversations. But I wanted to pick up on your last question about asking men to cook and aren't we all busy? And it has to be really controversial. I mean, so some other work I was engaged in recently was looking at um, time constraints around nutrition. And what that work still showed was that generally across the world, women still work more hours than men. So yes, we're all busy, but women are still particularly busy and still work longer hours. Um, and so, you know, what do we do about that? One of the things we were looking at as part of that work as well was actually, you know, agricultural projects. I started talking about agricultural projects, you know, these interventions that we do to improve agricultural output and to make the world a better place for everyone, you know, this kind of story. And um, we did a systematic review. This was um, with Saro Stefano um, and um, Sunitha Candiala, who also worked uh, as part of the El Sira group. And um, it, what this showed was really fascinating. So most agricultural projects don't measure what happens to time burdens, okay? But for the ones that did, the ones that actually measured what, you know, were people working longer hours afterwards, every single one of them increased people's work hours. So we're doing these, we're, we're doing projects in low and middle income countries where we know people are working long hours and we are increasing their work hours. We're not reducing them. We're not looking at reducing them. We're increasing them. And that's really counterintuitive, really problematic. And so one kind of answer is actually can we not develop better interventions that actually reduce people's time burdens and then they might have time to cook more and to feed their children more and to have leisure time as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So time is something that we can think about in policy terms. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, these are great questions. In the, uh, uh, the review of the research that's being done on agricultural nutrition that I worked on with Deborah uh, several years ago now, we found actually that I think it was well over two thirds of these projects, there were research projects, looked at outcomes on women in particular. So they were very focused on women, but they were very focused on women. Um, and we did a search for how many actually mentioned men mm. or male in the abstracts and the description, and there was one. 
out of 150 research projects actually mentioned men. So the idea was that we need to have this wonderful pro research project which is going to give us the research to enable us to empower women to do all of these things, and then which more. Uh, and then more, mm. um, without actually thinking about, about men at the same time. So um, I think that's an indicator of that. It's, it's a positive development that there's more thinking about women, but mm. it's not thinking about it in relation to... To, to men. So I, I've got hundreds of questions too, but I'll, I won't ask them. I'll <laughs> um, I'll, I think we can wrap up now. That was a really fascinating discussion, and as I said, very stimulating for me, and this project I'm working on at the moment, I'm definitely going to take on board some of the ideas yeah. that you've raised, so I'm really glad to have had this opportunity to be exposed to your, to your talks.